From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and it gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. Ever since Darwin, evolutionists have had a huge difficulty. The fossil record lacks the innumerable missing links predicted by them and required by their theory. Instead, all evolutionists can produce are a handful of debatable examples. Whereas, it's not just links that are missing, but whole links in the evolutionary chain. From time to time, evolutionists produce a transitional series du jour. One of the most prominent claims is that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs, a supposedly carnivorous group that included T. rex and velociraptor. However, even a number of evolutionary paleoornithologists, fossil bird experts, such as Alan Fiducia, Professor Emeritus at the University of North Carolina, have been harshly critical of the dogmatic way in which the theory has been promoted. They partly blame this dogma for the notorious Archaeoraptor hoax of 1999 and 2000. Another big problem is the hugely different avian lung design. The alleged first bird Archaeopteryx had the classic avian through-flow lungs, while the alleged feathered dino, Cynoceropteryx, had a clearly reptilian bellows lung. And it was younger than Archaeopteryx, according to the evolutionists' own dating methods and contrary to evolutionary expectations. As Fiducia likes to quip, quote, you can't be older than your grandfather. While evolutionists claim that a trait might persist in a lineage well after a descendant lineage has evolved, the evidence they are claiming dates the version with a fully formed avian lung prior to the other. When did the avian lung then evolve? And the main point was that evolution was alleged to be supported by the order of fossil succession, but clearly this is not so. One major point evolutionists use to support their missing link between birds and dinos is dinosaurs having feathers. One of the most famous is Cynoceropteryx, meaning Chinese reptilian wing, a tiny creature discovered in 1996. The largest known specimen weighed only about 0.55 kilograms and was only 1.07 meters long. This included its tail, the longest in relation to its total body length of any theropod. CMI has long pointed out that there is nothing in the biblical creationist model that states that dinosaurs must lack feathers. Having said that, however, we also point out that the examples to date have been far from convincing. There is good reason to believe that the feathers were just frayed structural collagen fibers. Nonetheless, the feather claim has its defenders as well, such as a professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and his colleagues, who claim to be, quote, refuting recent claims that the filaments are partially decayed dermal collagen fibers, end quote. To support their claimed refutation, they claim to have discovered color-producing cell organelles in a Cynoceropteryx specimen. These produce the very dark pigments in feathers. From this, they argued that they even had proof for stripes on its tail. But Professor Lingam Soliar at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, has criticized their claims as a, quote, optical illusion created when the scanning electron micrograph is reproduced at low image size, end quote. And in a recent paper, he has provided further evidence against this claim and also inadvertently found strong evidence for the Genesis Flood. As noted earlier, Cynoceropteryx had a reptilian lung. How could we know? Because unlike most dinosaur fossils, which are nothing but mineralized bones, this creature was well enough preserved that one could analyze the shape of some of its internal organs. The fact that these details were preserved points to very rapid burial, before these organs could rot or be scavenged away. Also, the preservation of the internal organs would seem to rule out vertebrate predators or scavengers, since they usually target the gut first. Therefore, Professor Lingam Suliar wanted to find out why Cynoceropteryx should be so well preserved. He noted the typical dead dinosaur posture with the neck and tail thrown backwards. In the last 20 years, 
Scientists have realized that this posture was actually the result of severe muscle spasms caused by malfunctioning of the central nervous system, especially with oxygen deprivation. Thus, they are the final death throes, which we have argued is consistent with most of them being drowned or buried alive by the flood. Since no one saw the creature die and fossilize, the next best thing is to see what happens to dead animals. Professor Lingam Suliar analyzed two dead animals over time in a natural setting, a genet, a cat-like animal but probably in the mongoose kind, and a Mozambique spitting cobra, the second deadliest snake in Africa after the black mamba. Sparing some of the gory details, within a day, for the genet, internal decomposition and bloating had already forced liquids out of the body openings. Then maggots had their fill, but notably not in the gut region until day four. After that, the decay increased exponentially. So only one day later, almost all the soft tissue was gone and the maggots left the carcass to pupate. With the cobra, the process took longer, but once again, it was mainly maggots, but this time also ants, and again, the gut was targeted quite late. Also, the insects liked the protein-rich connective tissue under the scales, which quickly separated the scales from the body. The authors note, it is possible to hypothesize from this phenomenon why scales are so rarely or sparsely preserved in small non-avian dinosaurs such as Sinusoropteryx, Comsognathus, and Juravenator. The absence of scales has frequently been used to suggest presence of feathers in the animal's primary condition. But neither the genet nor the cobra carcasses exhibited opisthotinus, which ruled out the earlier idea that the dead dinosaur posture was caused by post-mortem changes. We'll take a look at how Noah's flood fits into all this right after a short break. In 1938, the discovery of a large, unusual fish turned the scientific community on end. Dubbed a living fossil, the discovery of a coelacanth in South Africa shocked scientists around the world who thought that this type of fish had died out millions of years prior during the process of evolution. Living fossils or organisms preserved in the fossil record that still exist in similar form today. Their existence challenges the core concepts of evolution and creates a fascinating debate among scholars. Do they indicate a younger Earth than some have thought, placing the millions of years evolutionary timeline into question? Or do these living fossils represent a deeper mystery? Living Fossils, Volume 2, Evolution, The Grand Experiment, delves into these provocative questions. The book includes 700 color images presented in an easy-to-read format. Ideal as a standalone study unit for schools and homeschoolers or easily integrated into existing curricula. And the accompanying video is an astounding documentary that shows many modern animals and plants occur as fossils in rock layers that are supposedly dinosaur era. Yet museums don't portray dinosaurs as modern organisms to reinforce evolutionary ideas of origins. The Living Fossils book and documentary provide powerful evidence that microbes to man evolution never happened and the teacher's manual is designed for students from junior high to college. Students will learn how animals and plants are classified, how fossils are named, and how many modern appearing animals have been found with dinosaurs. The material presented in this course contain interviews with over 16 expert scientists from some of the most highly acclaimed scientific institutions, universities, and museums of the world. So check out Living Fossils and get a copy of the pack of the book, DVD, and teacher's manual today at creation.com slash store. So as we've noted, the dead dinosaur posture indicates death by suffocation. The specimens seem to exhibit the signs of the same purged decomposition liquids as the dead genet. The preserved gut, including a pair of eggs, indicate that any scavenging was likely by insects. Then the carcass was quickly buried at most a few days after death. The authors attribute the death to toxic volcanic gases, then burial by volcanic ash or mud flows. Actually, the evidence, considering how widespread the dead dino posture is, also seen in Archaeopteryx, is consistent with the Genesis flood. This would produce greatly increased volcanic activity, the rapid burial is also consistent with the flood. But what about insect decomposition? 
Actually, computer simulations have shown that the flood waters would not rise steadily, but would fluctuate so that land would be exposed for days at a time. This is why we find dinosaur footprints and eggs. This exposure would allow insects time to colonize the carcass, but not time to eat the gut, before it was buried completely. Back to the point of our article, the dead dinosaur posture provided insights into what the claimed feather filaments actually were. The death throes caused buckling of the thick integument, the skin, on the animal's back, which would be possible only if the filaments were part of a single structure, not separate feathers. Comprehensive and tensile forces acting on a clearly unified structure, that is, an upright frill or crest overlying the neck, back and tail of the Sinusoropteryx, as opposed to individual proto-feathers, is considered more reasonable. The results include the most controversial issue associated with Sinusoropteryx and strongly demonstrate, based on soft tissue analysis and forensic animation, that the dorsal, externally preserved integumental tissue represents a dorsal crest rather than proto-feathers. This supports their earlier statement. The description presented here shows the filamentous structures were internal support fibers that together with the overlying dermal tissue comprised a composite structure, that is, an external frill or crest, comprehensively refuting the notion of free filaments, that is, proto-feathers in Sinusoropteryx. In further support, quote, the tail terminates in a unique, smoothly edged, spatula-shaped structure, end quote which near the end provided, quote, little surface area for the attachment of proto-feathers, end quote. Also, because this structure seemed to live near a lake, according to evolutionary reconstructions anyway, a crest-like structure on the tail or body or both would be useful in swimming. So they express amazement that such a structure had not been considered. While feathered dinosaurs are not ruled out by the biblical creationist model, the claims of feathers are looking more and more dubious. In one of the most famous claimed feathered dinosaurs, Sinusoropteryx, the evidence indicates that the filaments were not separate feathers, but support fibers for a unified structure like crest. Also, the death posture indicates suffocation, and careful analysis of the normal decay process of animal carcasses in nature shows that it must have been buried completely within a few days at most. Another theory for the dead dino posture is also consistent with the flood. It turns out that killed chickens spontaneously go into the same arched back pose after immersion underwater. They have a strong ligament along the spine, the ligamentum elasticum, which is already taut. The buoyancy underwater enabled the ligament to overcome the weight and pull the neck and tail back. As the muscles decayed, this ligament encountered even less resistance, so the bending increased even more. This effect would have been even stronger in dinosaurs with long, slender necks and tails. They would have needed very strong, elastic ligaments for energy saving. The length would have also increased the leverage of the elastic forces. A Swiss sedimentologist and German paleontologist in a detailed study explained, a strong ligamentum elasticum was essential for all long-necked dinosaurs with a long tail. The preloaded ligament helps them save energy in their terrestrial mode of life. Following their death, at which they were immersed in water, the stored energy along the vertebra was strong enough to arch back the spine, increasingly so as more and more muscles and other soft parts were decaying. It is a special highlight that in Comsognathus specimen, these gradual steps of recurvature can be substantiated too. Therefore, Biomechanics is ruling the post-mortem weird posture of a carcass in a watery grave, not death throes. Of course, the Genesis Flood would provide excellent conditions for full immersion of animals. The Creation.com article podcast is hosted by me, Joseph Darnell, and produced out of the U.S. studio of Creation Ministries International. Learn more about our ministry at Creation.com. You'll find lots of interesting related content in the links and show notes along with the description for this episode. This episode's article was written by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. 
Our speakers and scientists host a really cool talk show called Creation.com Talk, which you can find right here in your podcast app or on our YouTube channel. And get in touch if you want to arrange to have one of our creationist speakers visit your church. If you would like to help us, become a monthly supporter making a donation at creation.com slash donate. You can also help out by telling your friends to check out Creation Magazine. Be sure to follow Creation Ministries International on Facebook and Instagram, or subscribe to our free e-newsletter. From everyone at creation.com, thanks for listening.